Please take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. As I mentioned this morning, somebody may kind of think a study of Exodus, but honestly, I have thoroughly enjoyed the study and preparation for the lessons and then preaching from Exodus. And tonight we're looking at Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. Now, sometimes we may think, well, here's the story of Moses, or here's the story of Israel in their exodus. Yes, but I want to tell you, it's a story of God. It's a story of God. We, we talked about that kind of more at length as we were at about chapter 3, but I think it's also very evident when you get to chapter 6 as well. Now, of course, last week we were at chapter 5 and ended up there. And Go back and look at chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Now, this is on the heels of Moses having gone to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's kind of like, you want to leave? Ah, you're just lazy. You're idle. I'll make your work harder from now on. No more straw for the bricks. You've got to gather your own straw, but you've got to make as many bricks. So life was harder for the Israelites. And so then they responded to Moses in a very negative fashion, even said to Moses, you made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So the very ones that should have been the best support to Moses kind of turning their back on him. And so you find in verse 22, I think it's almost a gut reaction of Moses to what then has happened. Then Moses, now look at this. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? Now, here he's crying out to God, but not in the best of ways. In fact, he's blaming God. Verse 23 For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Now look at this. And you have not delivered your people at all. Now we pointed out last week that Moses here, certainly a man of faith, he believes that there's a God. But it seems here there's a little bit of doubt in trusting God to fulfill his promises. God has not delivered Israel yet. God will deliver Israel. So Moses has made this kind of accusation to God. Now what does God do? And that's what the half of chapter 6 is about. God's response. Now I read that there is a Talmudic principle. This would be, of course, body of literature of the Jews that says silence in the face of an accusation is in effect acknowledging that the accused is guilty as charged. That's maybe the Talmud. That's not the Bible. In fact, I would have to say to that, there was one man... Charges were made against him. And he was like a sheep before the shares and said not a word. Jesus basically gave no defense for himself. Because a man does not speak up when he's accused, maybe he's not a quick thinker. Maybe he's shy generally. Maybe he feels like he's been bullied. Could be all kinds of reasons. But I want to tell you something. God speaks up in chapter 6. In fact, you find the word I. It's God speaking now, so the word I is God's personal pronoun. 
from verses 1 through verse 9, you find I 18 times. So this is all about God. You find then even the personal pronouns my possessive twice. And then you find over and over what he's going to do. In fact, seven times from verse 6 and following, you find I will. Seven times. I will. So he is answering Moses. You know, don't you appreciate that? He could have... Moses has not been easy to deal with, has he? You know, two chapters of Exodus is just the excuses that Moses made when God appeared to him at the burning bush. Moses has not been so easy to deal with. And now Moses, to God, makes accusation. Moses can be very thankful. All he got was an explanation. God was patient with him. So in verse 6, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. There you have it already, the first of the eyes, eyes 18 times in these nine verses. Verse 2, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Now, I wish that you would notice that as you see the Lord, it is in all caps, albeit the lower caps. It's not capital L, lowercase, O-R-D. This is, and we had made mention of this a few weeks ago, I think more on Sunday morning then, uh, a tetragrammaton. And that's a fancy word that just means four letters. But this is the YHWH, the name of God. And the Israelites, out of respect for God's name, would not say that name out loud. And so, frankly, the pronunciation of it was lost. And then with the fact that the Hebrew alphabet had consonants but not the vowels it's okay so what do we do with this word well most translations have elected to for YHWH go capital L then lower capitals ORD and that occurs literally thousands of times in your Old Testament by the way, that word, of course, is Hebrew, but no, it's not in the New Testament. Well, now there is the word Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Instead of it being the Y-H-W-H, it's Adonai. It's a different word altogether. Now in, and I didn't realize it was actually as, as late as it was, but in 1518... That's when it was that, and I can't even pronounce the man's name. But he proposed taking the vowels from Adonai, Lord, and inserting them with kind of that the YHWH. And that's where then Jehovah was born, where Jehovah came from. If you, see the, if you see the word Jehovah, just think, basically, that's man-made. And it didn't occur before 1518. 
You find it prominently in the American Standard Translation, and that's how the American Standard Translation dealt with the YHWH or the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. Like I said, most translations, though, they have reverted to just saying the Lord, the capital L, remember now, lower caps, O-R-D. And that's what he's making mention of here. But by my name, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Then he says, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. So he goes back and he reminds Moses, I've not forgotten. I made this covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. And I've now heard the groanings of, of the Hebrews, of my people. I've not forgotten. So verse 6. So therefore say to the people of, the God, of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will. Now this is the first of, as I mentioned, seven in succession, I will. In other words, what he is going to do for Israel. And here the first, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you. That's the second. I will deliver you from slavery to them. And number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Number four, I will take you to be my people. The next, I will be your God and you shall know that. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The next, I will, there's the next. Number six, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then number seven, I will give it to you for a possession. And so with each I will, it's here's what I'm gonna do. And it starts with, I'm gonna fix this Egyptian problem. And then I'm gonna get you to that promised land. He's not forgotten. And though Moses asked, you've not delivered your people at all. It's just a not yet, not yet. But he will. And this is God taking the time to strengthen Moses' faith. To convince him to convince Israel. You can depend upon and you can trust on in. You know, we've said several times in this study, sometimes things just don't happen when and how we think they should. And maybe we need to kind of remember some occasions like this where for all of those people living, it didn't happen when and exactly how they thought it should. But God was true to his promises. And so in verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. It's almost like they're yet to be convinced. You know, later on, we have the plagues, don't we? We haven't got there yet. Well, that's not too far away. Ten of them. And it took finally that tenth for Pharaoh to allow the people of Israel to leave. But what do you think was accomplished as well with the people of Israel during those ten plagues? God's power was proved over and over again. 
hear they say? They don't listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. God will be proving himself not just to Pharaoh, but to Israel as well. Now verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this land. Notice the tone change. Back in chapter 3, verse 18, Moses was told, you tell him, please. And then it was three days to worship. He didn't start out that way in verse in chapter 5, but then he then did go back and, 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 and say, you know, the pleas and uh, the three days journey, the week in sacrifice or worship. The tone has changed though now. There's no pleas. Here you see the demand, God making the demand. You just tell him, let the people of Israel go out of this land. No please, no three days, let them go. Moses, it's almost like true to form. Just like you had two chapters of objections to God at the burning bush. Now in this short little bit here, verses 12 and actually all in verse 12, you've got three objections of Moses. Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. They've not listened to me. They're not going to listen to me. Two, how shall then Pharaoh listen to me? It's kind of like Pharaoh didn't listen to me either, and if they won't, surely Pharaoh won't. And then three, for I am of uncircumcised lips. Once again, kind of complaining, possibly complaining there about his speech as he did before. So he continues to object. Or if we're honest, how many excuses do we tend to make for what we know God wants who would please God? But we're reluctant. Then 13, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now this chapter, that's kind of one part. And then there's a second part. And the second part is verses 14 to the end of the chapter. And if you have a heading like I do, it says, the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. So God's already answered all of Moses' you know, accusations. He's let him know, I'll do this thing. And then once again, give Moses instructions to go to Pharaoh. Now the genealogy. And a lot of times genealogies are easy. Honestly, they're easy to get lost in. And it's sometimes difficult to always know the significance of each and every name. And, you know, given that we're dealing with kind of a time period and so much I'm wanting to cover and we need to cover, I don't want to look at this genealogy with any great detail. But I do want to make mention down in verse 20. Verse 20, Amram took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. Now oftentimes we will speak of Jochebed as Moses' mother, and rightly so. She is Moses' mother. But this is the first time that you read Jochebed's name, and you only read that name one other time, Numbers 26, verse 59. So this is kind of, we can be thankful this is here in this genealogy so we can know what Moses' mother's name was. Now, another interesting thing, as, as he begins to list some of these people and then their children and et cetera, going down to verse 23, verse 23, Aaron took as his wife Elisheba and the daughter of Amenadab. We don't use those names today, do we? And the sister of Nation, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So here we're talking about the sons of Aaron. 
Now, if we were to say, okay, tell me about these sons. I have an idea that these first two, the majority here would be able to tell us something about because you've heard it so many times by preachers about what in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu did. Leviticus chapter 10, of course, you might say what they did and what happened to them, that's kind of quick in the chapter, though kind of the remainder of the chapter still deals with some facets concerning that story. But there you read that they offered strange fire. The English Standard Version says unauthorized fire. And then fire went out from the Lord and consumed them. And I think it's a legitimate place to go to say, hey, here's worship. And God does expect us to obey him when we worship. I can't just call it worship and do as I please. But I worship as pleases God. They were doing this in an unauthorized fashion way. Got fire from the wrong place. God was not pleased. So that's something kind of to learn from, well, the Nadab and Abihu. But there's, not, there's something that's not here in this, in this genealogy that I do find interesting. You've got Aaron's children mentioned. Of course, maybe, maybe the reason is because he was going to be their high priest and then they follow in his footsteps. But you don't have... Moses, children mentioned. You don't have Moses' children mentioned. And I would like to ask the question, why? I mean, Moses is obviously a more prominent character than even Aaron, though Aaron is certainly a prominent character, but Moses more so, and certainly to this point. And yet you got the four sons of Aaron mentioned, but None of Moses. And, and why is this? And I hope that you would then say, well, Steve, you've asked a question the Bible doesn't answer. Anything you say is speculation, therefore may not be worthy of much discussion. And that is the honest truth. But oftentimes we do have questions, or, and maybe we don't have an exact Bible answer for it. Now, tell you what one person wrote about this. They said, you know, sometimes very prominent characters so overshadow their children. It's almost like their children never quite rise to that level, so you just don't hear about the children. Well, that does happen. I don't know that we could assume that what happened here. Another person took this as an opportunity just to say, you need to do everything you can. Raise your children right. And you know, I think that this is a good place to say that. Here you've got Aaron. Aaron, he was not a perfect man by no means, but he was the one that God chose to be the high priest That's a pretty good recommendation. And yet now we know two of his children, they so sin, they lost their life. And, and Moses' children, we don't even read about them here. What about them? You can take Bible characters Sometimes reading about them, being very impressed with their lives. Maybe even impressed with what God says about them. And then you read sad stories about their children. And everybody here knows of, or maybe even have experienced, 
godly seeing and knowing, godly parents had a very difficult time with choices their children have made. Before Tish and I married, I asked an older preacher, had great confidence in this man. And I said, I'm getting married. Got any words of advice? He said, I'm going to keep it simple. Make sure you always give your wife and then the children that come enough of your time. Things didn't turn out as well for him. He was the preacher's preacher. What he accomplished and did in his life was phenomenal. But what he accomplished as a father was rather sad. And I really think at that point and at that juncture, if he could have gone back, that's what he would have changed. He would have made sure he had given his children the adequate time that they needed. There was a, and it was just a story about a man who had a dream, and to be frank, we know that that makes it just a story. But that he was in ministry and actually working with youth, and there were 50, 50 in his youth group. And it was as if in that dream he had a prophecy that 49 would be saved, one lost. And he threw himself into his work because with that prophecy, he thought, I'm going to be successful. And so he lived it every moment of his life. He lived it. And true enough, he was successful. Successful there and successful even, you might say, that greater brotherhood took note of what he had accomplished. And then he got word that his 16-year-old son was dealing drugs. And then as time progressed, that child left the church, left God, He'd saved the 49, but the one he lost was his own son. That's just a story. But I have an idea that there is a lot of truth to that story, and it's happened many, many times. I don't think it's just coincidental that you read in Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That verse speaks to fathers. Now, somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the mothers? Oh, I think Moses himself, if you say, Moses, how did he turn out like this? I think it's because Jochebed, his mother, uh, being hired to raise him for that period of time. Much of it. Think about Timothy and his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. So yes, it takes the mom and the dad. But years ago, I read in a, I read in a magazine. I don't remember who wrote the article. Don't even remember the name of the magazine. But it was making the point about the need for fathers to be that godly influence on the children. And it said, so many, many, many times, people speak glowingly of their godly mother and then live like their devilish dad. And to be honest with you, that just made me just stop reading and just start thinking. And I, and I could, I could think of mother after mother after mother that lived that godly life whose 
husband didn't live the godly life. In some cases, maybe a member of the Lord's church, but a little more hypocritical and unfaithful than faithful. And how so many of those children were not faithful any longer. That was just anecdotal. That was just, that person saying that, they didn't have a Bible verse to put behind it. And those examples I could think of, again, that was just anecdotal, just things that came to my mind. Did make me realize we've got to do all we can while we can. I have an idea that if I were to poll every parent here that has adult children and say, if there's something you could change or something that you could do better, is there something? And I have an idea that for every adult parent, they would probably say, yes, there is. No matter how godly they were or how hard they tried to be that godly parent see we're not perfect and we learn as we go and then we get to this point of we we look back over it all but we can't go back do you know I think most would say yes there's something I do a little different something I try harder at I'm kind of saying this from here we've got Nadab and Abihu. Here we don't even have Moses' children mentioned. To just take a moment and say, parents, let's do the best we can, intentionally, while we can, and all we can, while we have that opportunity. Exodus chapter 6. God proves himself again to Moses and then that genealogy if we could assist you in your obedience there's need for baptism for prayer we ask you to come as we